I want our people to taste some history. I want them to breathe it in. Let it rumble down in there, in the city of their soul, as my mama used to say, and then breathe it out. Because tonight, we're going to look at a part of American history, the part of black history that doesn't get talked about. Do you remember the riots in Detroit in 1967? You remember those riots? Have you, I mean, to, to the viewers who watch, some of the audience, have you even heard of that? Do you even know that Detroit was set on fire? Detroit blew up. It blew up. Five days, the city was on fire. And you'd be surprised tonight, as I present to you this documentary in a second, tonight you'd be surprised at how what happened in Detroit is happening right now in Los Angeles and Atlanta and Chicago and New York and Miami and Philadelphia. The same conditions that created that, that riot and that rebellion are happening right now. Woe to America if it does not watch this documentary and roll to America if it does not understand the connection between past, present, and future. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's amazing, it's amazing. <laughs> Tonight I want to take you back to 1967 and that long, hot, desperate summer when the police were beating on our sons and cracking our daughters upside their head, when racial antagonism and racial oppression was running wild when white people thought they had a privilege and a right to call black people niggers and coons and sambos. And when black people had to find their courage and their strength, not just to liberate themselves, but to get out of the bed in the morning and not go crazy. I want to take you back to 1967. I want you to sit in that summer. And tonight, I present to you this extraordinary documentary, one that I think will bless your life and change your soul. It is, after all, called Fox Soul. And here on Fox Soul, <laughs> we endeavor to affect your soul. And we're going to do that tonight by watching something that our good friend Hugh Perkins put together from our affiliate in Detroit, our Fox affiliate in Detroit. Thank you, Brother Hugh, for giving this, us this opportunity to watch this. On the other side of it, I'm going to come back and have a conversation with Hugh about it. We're going to talk about the documentary. We're going to ask him some questions that I want to know. It is a powerful testimony. Don't you go anywhere. You sit down and breathe your history because it lives whether you like it or not. Let's go to the documentary. situation to deal with that I've seen now short of Vietnam. upper story just fell in. It was leaning precariously for some time. Now it just fell into the street. We just heard a sniper shot. No one knows where it has come from here at the corner of Taylor and 12. There are rows of houses here on my right, at least four or five, all that's standing, the foundation, and the chimneys, even the basements are on fire. Our community uh, has been torn apart. We have spent years trying to build bridges and then to have persons just come in and in a few hours to destroy this is a little bit more than some of us can take. I'm Gil Perkins and we're on 12th Street, renamed Rosa Parks Boulevard. This is ground zero for the tumultuous days that would forever change the landscape of Detroit. Now, what really happened here is still up for debate. Some call it a riot. Others say it was an uprising, a rebellion. Whatever you call it, we're not here to rewrite history. We're here to show you history, our history, from the TV2 archives, film from five decades ago. Congressman, is there any relief in sight? How have you been handling this situation? Well, I think that we can't overpraise the way that the local officials have handled this matter. 
I think that finally it's become painfully clear that we can't isolate the problems, that they are spreading indeed throughout the whole city. Entire blocks have been leveled by fire and pockets of destruction exist throughout the city. Losses due to fire and looting have been estimated at hundreds of millions of dollars and these estimates may well prove to be conservative. This is 12th and Claremont where it all started. Right now it's Thomas Gordon Park, but back then this was a busy area filled with shops and entertainment. People had gathered here at an illegal after-hours nightclub that police called a blind pig. They had come here to celebrate the homecoming of two soldiers from the Vietnam War. Detroit police raided that bar, called in paddy wagons, and hauled off about 80 people to jail. That's when all hell broke loose. When it ended, 43 people were dead and more than 1,000 injured. You see all this fire and all this stuff going on, you think of the war going on. In the middle of all the chaos, Tiger's great Willie Horton felt compelled to come here to the corner of 12th and Claremont. The 67 Tigers were in the middle of the pennant race, and Horton, still in his Tigers uniform, jumped on top of a car to try to calm the crowd. At the gate, they told we had to go home for our secure purpose, and, uh, and you see all that black smoke. I saw what's going on, so the riot is burning down on 12th and 12th. And uh, so I went in the clubhouse and all the thing came to my mind, just put my clothes in my duffel bag and next day I know I was going out there in the middle of the ride on 12th and Clermont trying to talk to the people, bring peace. Uh, we've called up the full National Guard and we should have by uh, tomorrow morning about uh, six to 7,000 National Guardsmen here as well as the additional uh, state police and of course the full uh, Detroit Police Department. Now, I think one of my teammates, Mickey Lotus, he's in the reserve. He was down there in a couple of days later. Because we went to Baltimore and he had to stay here because he was in the reserve. The Detroit Tigers are making that push for the American League pennant and they're after the Chicago White Sox this weekend. But they're without the services of pitcher Mickey Lolich. He's here guarding the city of Detroit. Mickey, when did you get the word? Well, I got the word uh, Tuesday uh, about noon. I had my suitcase on the bus. I was ready to leave for Baltimore. and. They informed me that they were looking for Wayne Redman. In return, I called out at the base, and they said, yes, I was supposed to report. So I took my suitcase off the bus, and I waved to Mayo, and I started <laughs> heading out of the parking lot. And he says, well, who's going to pitch in uh, Chicago? I says, I don't know. You're going to have to find somebody else. Sure hope they're going to get in there. I sort of feel lost not being with them right now. I had spent some time during the service during summer camp, and I've been spending more time in a green uniform, and I have a white one lately. When do you think you'll uh, be able to join? Any idea? Well, I think we'll have to talk to General Thoughtmorton about that one. I don't have the slightest idea. It's extremely difficult for our law enforcement officers, the state, the National Guard, and our local police to enforce the law and maintain the degree of law and order that we all expect. And unless we have the cooperation of the people of this city, it's just not going to be done. They're the most important ingredient at this point, and that's why it's so important that they do this. Don't you know? Don't you know the big deal, boy? This is a scene that's being repeated so many times in Detroit, it's hardly news anymore, and yet it's the story of the city of Detroit, and it's our... Do you know at all why these fires were set? Do you have any idea? Uh, why well, I have an idea? I don't know why the... I mean, how they started, why? Why the fires were set in the city? Well, in my opinion, it just left from frustration, you know, to me, frustration to try to get things that I didn't add to you. I don't know what it's all about. This is now a vacant lot that the city is trying to turn into a park, but 50 years ago, from Pingree all the way to Blaine, this was a neighborhood filled with houses after houses, filled with families who lived and worked and played here. But in July of 67, it all went up in smoke. Hello, ma'am. I was right in it. You were right in it? Yeah. And sure enough, it was fire. It was people that was angry. It was terrible. My car burned up in the front, and we kept water. We had to wash the porch down with keeping the hose on the, you know, porch fell in. It was terrible. 
The fire department couldn't come in, and there wasn't nothing nobody could really do. But just keep our hoses on, on this house to keep them from burning. Long after the smoke clears away and life returns to normal here in Detroit, the families that lived in these burned out homes and the hundreds of apartments that were destroyed by the arsonist fire bombs will be battling with insurance companies. And it's still feared that some of the insurance companies may use the insurrection clause as a reason for not paying the claims. They didn't give one dime to what was happening to this house. So you got no... No insurance for my car, had car and house insurance for on the same company. They offered me $140. Project Rebuild, the mayor's committee, which is going to try to do something for the three to 400 families that have lost their homes, among other plans, hope to uh, bulldoze some of these burned out buildings, uh, lease the property from the existing owners, put on mobile homes. Most of the families, however, have been absorbed into the community and are temporarily living with other families. Did you ever think of moving out? No, uh, I promise my God, if I got here, I would not go any place. One thing is for sure that everybody in Detroit in the riot area or not are going to be affected by the damage. Oh, you knew that back then was you got to protect your house. That's right. I'm trying to protect my house and that's what I was trying to do. The claims and the heavy damage may cause people in Detroit to pay a whale of a price for future insurance. This is Joe Weaver on Pingree near Linwood. Approach the area with your lights out. Approach the area with your lights out. In this darkness, uh, one never knows what's lurking in the shadows of these, especially the side streets leading off of uh, 12th Street. There's continued sniper fire down here from Herman Kiefer. We can hear it uh, every so often. Pow, pow, pow. A few shots will ring out. Uh, there's also been continued harassment of the fire department as they've tried to fight some fires in this area. As governor of the state of Michigan, I do hereby officially recommend the immediate deployment of federal troops into Michigan to assist state and local authorities in reestablishing law in the state of Detroit. I'm joined in this recommendation by Jerome P. Cavanaugh, mayor of the city of Detroit. This recommendation follows a period of four hours in which uncontrollable arson, looting, and threat to human life by snipers, have, as well as in the cities of Hamtramck and Holland Park. The first contingents of the 5,000 troops started to arrive at Selfridge Air Force Base about 3.45. About six and a half hours after Governor Romney requested them in a telegram to President Johnson. They consist of the 2nd Brigade of the 101st from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and the 3rd Brigade of the 82nd Airborne from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Let's go, buddy. Get out of the way. Let's go. We just heard a sniper shot. No one knows where it has come from here at the corner of Taylor and 12. Police are down the street a half a block uh, searching some uh, suspects. The residents here are dazed. They don't know which way to go to get uh, away from the National Guardsmen and the uh, direction of the shot because nobody knows where it has come from. Just down the street, uh, not too many blocks away from where they have this sniper pinned down, the police uncovered uh, three bodies in the basement of a packaged liquor store. They surmised that uh, these three bodies, which were being taken out at this moment, were those of looters that were trapped uh, downstairs when the uh, burning floor fell in on top of them. The uh, state troopers and the uh, National Guard units have been inadequate, and uh, I think that the request to the President of the United States for a federal presence is timely and appropriate and is necessary. This rumbly noise you hear here is coming from two tanks which are parked on 12th at the boulevard. Uh, these tanks are moving out now, rumbling down 12th at the boulevard. They're crossing the boulevard right now. This is the big push they've been talking about all night. First they gave up, they gave this area over to the snipers. 
more or less said it's sniper territory and let them have it. Wait a minute, we're just, we're pulling up now at 14th in Davidson. They've got a searchlight up on the third floor of a brick building on the south side of Davidson. The tanks have both pulled up and stopped, and they've got their machine guns pointed that way. <laughs> That was at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's 7.30 now, and somehow it's a completely different scene. It's not a sinister-looking building anymore. It's an apartment house, an apartment house where a lot of innocent people were living. Mr. and Mrs. James Porter uh, live in the apartment house. Uh, Mr. Porter, what was it like? It was terrible. It was just like uh, blasting fire, you know, and bullets chicken, uh, ricocheting all over the area. Did you hear any shots come from this building before they yes, started? Yes, it sounded like we were in Vietnam or something. All this excitement and, boy, I was panicked and I told my husband about it and then he said, get on that floor and I ran on the floor. Although hundreds of rounds were fired into this building, fortunately, no one was injured. This is Jack McCarthy reporting from the 2200 block of West Davidson. In 67, when the stuff jumped off, when I say the stuff, the rebellion, the riot, the revolution, uh, the civil disturbance, whatever your terminology is, the uprising, I remember that day. This place has significance for you. This is where I started, uh, basically in Detroit. You're standing now at 2683 Buena Vista. It's all foliage now, but back in the day, it was on and popping. It was a neighborhood. Now it looks like somebody just came through here and just tore it up. But people lived here, good people. And the troops were coming down this street. And I stood in my window, and I was looking outside to see what was going on. And I'll never forget this federal trooper took his long gun. I thought it was a big, maybe it's because I was small and short, or maybe because the gun was long and taller, I don't know. But it seemed like a long gun. He took his long gun and he pointed it at me just, I thought he was getting ready to shoot me. And I jumped the hell out the window. When you look back, though, at a 17-year-old Wendell Anthony, uh -huh. and you look back at the night you knew that the Motor City was on fire. Yeah. Was there anger? Was there fear? Was there both? It was both. It was anger. It was fear. It was frustration. It was intimidation. It was like, what the hell are we going to do? In July. What did you say in your sermon today after what's happened in Detroit? Well, my sermon was on peace uh, because the president has called for us to have a day of prayer. And I feel that we must have faith, interpreted faith with works. This means that we must involve ourselves more in politics because it's going to be a political decision as to who runs this town. If the lawless element is going to run the town or if the element that believes in law and order is going to run the town, it'll be a matter of people making political decisions. Fifty years ago, the number one issue was the police department. And the fact that black people did not feel as though they were respecting, and they weren't. There were no blacks of any significant number on the police department, fire department. We only had one black on the common council at the time. That was Nick Hood. What do you see for the future of Detroit, the immediate future perhaps? What is your opinion on that? Well, I just see a lot of hard work of trying to bring all of the various diverse elements of our community together. Even after 50 years. What are we going to do about it? Now, admittedly, things are different. You got a, you've had five black mayors. You got a black prosecutor. You got a black Wayne County executive. You got a black police chief. You got an integrated police department. You got an integrated fire department. You got black commissioners. You got seven black folk on the city council. You got Hugh Perkins on Fox News. We didn't have all that back then. Firemen here ahead of us <clears throat> working desperately trying to keep two homes here from completely 
going down, but of course they're not going to be able to do it. They're going to burn to the ground. I've heard before that frustration lives through aggression, and it's what has happened. Do you think it can ever happen again in Detroit? Well, I do. I really do. Follow when you're ready. When you have nothing, you can't lose anything. If you don't want to have a repeat of 67, what do we do? We learn from history. It's, it's, this don't take no PhD. Jobs, economic opportunity, educational system. We want the same thing that everybody else wants. We want the same thing. It's not no different here. And so I'm simply saying, I don't know why we complicate this. What happened here 50 years ago was dubbed the 12th Street Riots. But was it a riot, a rebellion, an uprising? It's far from black and white. It represents a racial rebellion that goes from coast to coast. In the city of Detroit, it represents one simple thing. Black people want control of black communities. As I saw the kind of people being brought into the police stations last night, they're the black have-nots of this country who have stored up more resentment than I or anybody else thought that they could store up. And it's coming out. And it's ugly. There's no question it was a rebellion. And the fact being that a rebellion is uh, is an act or actions against things that you've been repressed, suppressed against for, for, for years and years. And people tend to think that this is as, as 1967. This started long before 1967. I call it a riot. I definitely call it a riot. And I lived at uh, 12th and Bo uh, Woodrow Wilson in Boston. It was like one block over and three short blocks down. So it was right there. There were National Guardsmen at our door. You could see the fire, you could smell the smoke, you could hear the clashes. It was terrible. Same thing at night. You could hear bullets and hear shots all the time. We slept on the floor because you don't want somebody to shoot through the window. And so later on, you go riding around and looking and say, God, dog, look at this stuff. I mean, windows and cars and houses and trash and it looked like somebody had dropped a bomb. I looked like we were in bombed out Beirut. It was unbelievable. It was a riot, Hugh. It was a riot. About 1,700 businesses were targeted. Black shop owners would put signs in their windows that read, Soul Brother, in hopes of being spared. A Negro shop owner, why were you looted? Well, with any, any group, any mob, you're going to find people who uh, they don't care about race, they don't care about color, they don't care about religion, anything. They just want to get something for nothing. I hope that uh, the impression that the whole Negro community is, is, is not involved in this gets through. Actually, it's a small percentage of, of people. It was three young white boys who said it. Do you, did you see them around here before? Did they live around no, here? No, I didn't see them. They don't live around here. Do you see any sense to this? No, none at all. Because the people had taken everything out of the stores. There was nothing left. Now, why should they set the places on fire after everything's gone out of the places? This is senseless. Do you see any racial overtones to this at all? No, I don't, because I can see just as many white as I can see colored taking things out of the stores. The overwhelming majority of the Negro community is stunned, shocked, and dismayed by the lawlessness of a very small percentage of people and youngsters that have brought this holocaust upon this city. This distrust of police has been going on for a long time. It was a normal thing for them to stop young black men, to throw them up against a building or against a car, and beat them up. And just so happens that in 1957, my first year of, of high school, I became a victim. And in fact, it was my first year at Cass Tech. As I was walking across the street, this car was called the Big Four, with four very large white officers, grabbed me, threw me up against the car, and proceeded to beat me, curse me, racial epithets. I mean, it was just beyond one's imagination. The officers told me to get my black ass out of there. 
I ran home, but I made myself a promise that evening that I was going to become a police officer. When you looked at 67 living through that, though, <clears throat> yes, there was a sense of rebellion, but was that not also a sense of fear? I was shot at by the police, uh, my fellow officers, and the reason being that I was a black person. You were on the, on the, the force at the time? Yeah, yeah, I was on, on the police department. I'd been on just short of one month and I was stopped over on Chicago by the freeway. And these officers got out of their car. I was in uniform. And they got out of their car and the name calling and told me I was gonna die that night and shot at me. The good thing about that time is I was young and agile <laughs> and I dove into my car, which is a 1965 Mustang, and sped off with my hand on the accelerator, my other hand on the the uh, steering wheel as I sped off, but well, they were shooting at me. Now, I, you know, you're shocked, but you say to yourself, you know, if they're doing this to me, a fellow officer, what are they gonna do to other people in this city? And the proof is in the pudding in that there were 43 people killed during the 1967 rebellion. The casualties from this conflict have been arriving all night long here at Detroit General Hospital in the heart of the city. Talking to one doctor at 4 a.m. in the morning, he said, it's just beginning. In the last 10 minutes, three dead bodies have been wheeled down this corridor and into these rooms. Countless others are being wheeled into emergency rooms where doctors are working feverishly on their cases, most of them serious. Attendants here say since the rioting broke out, they've handled approximately 475 cases, and they say they really can't keep an accurate count. They claim that they have at least 23 to 25 deaths handled just here at Detroit General Hospital. Attendants here say tonight's cases are more serious than last night when most of those treated were for lacerations and burns. Tonight, most of the casualties are from gunshot wounds. This is Jerry Hodak reporting from Detroit General Hospital. Days of violence and looting saw 7,000 people arrested and shuffled through an overburdened justice system. As prosecuting attorney of this county and as chief law enforcement officer in this county, I want to assure all the citizens that those people who are committing crimes during this time of disorder are being arrested and they are being prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Today, Tuesday, Wayne County Jail is full. It is full to capacity and prisoners are being moved to Jackson State Prison. And I want to warn all those people who might be thinking of looting or stealing or burning that we do not, we not to fool themselves because we're going to prosecute them. We're watching the transfer of prisoners from Wayne County Jail, which is seriously overcrowded, these men are boarding chartered DSR buses for a ride, we're told, to Jackson Prison. Fifty years ago, Detroit was the fifth largest city in the country with one and a half million residents. Today, Detroit doesn't even break the top 20 with fewer than 700,000. Back then, black people made up 40% of the population. Now, car plants and businesses were starting to move out to the suburbs long before the summer of 67, and those who could afford it, mostly white, followed. But after those five days in July, what started as a stream of white flight became a raging river. What's the matter with you? You see, the fires like this, it's not just the burning of the building, it's a tragedy of people being displaced from their homes. At least two elderly ladies lived upstairs in that apartment over the fire. And now, two doors down, here is a family starting to evacuate. Did you, did you live upstairs here, yeah. sir? Uh -huh. Is it getting pretty hot up there? Yes, it is. How many, how many people in your family? Five. Ch all of them children? Uh, three of them children. Do you have, uh, you have any place to go? No, I don't. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? Go out and go away from a fire until I find some place. I don't know. There are no white solutions. There are no black solutions. There are no democratic solutions. And there are no Republican solutions. There are only American solutions that deal with the problems of all the people, and we need to work on that basis if we are to strengthen the basic unity of this community. The summer of 67 didn't change the world, but it did change Detroit. In the middle of the racial divide, the death and the damage, Detroit has stepped up to help each other as they had never done before. Everyday people like teachers, cab drivers, housewives, students, 
risked their own lives to protect complete strangers from the violence, the gunfire. They provided food to the paramedics, firefighters, and the many who were left homeless. Despite the anger and the fear, there were people, black and white, who reached out to each other in faith and in hope. Out of the ashes grew a determination to prevent this from ever happening again. Yes, problems remain, but the lesson from 67 is that we can solve them if we work together.